Part Twelve of Death World by Harry Harrison. Part Twelve. Further reading of the log produced no new evidence. There was a good deal more information about the early animal and plant life and how deadly they were, as well as the first defenses against them. Interesting historically, but of no use whatsoever in countering the menace. The captain apparently never thought that life forms were altering on Pyrrhus, believing instead that dangerous beasts were being discovered. He never lived to change his mind. The last entry in the log, less than two months after the first attack, was very brief and in a different handwriting. Captain Kurkowski died today of poisoning following an insect bite. His death is greatly mourned. The why of the planetary revulsion had yet to be uncovered. Kirk must see this book, Jason said. He should have some idea of the progress being made. Can we get transportation, or do we walk to City Hall? Walk, of course, Meta said. Then you bring the book. At two G's I find it very hard to be a gentleman and carry the packages. They had just entered Kirk's outer office when a shrill screaming burst out of the phone screen. It took Jason a moment to realize that it was a mechanical signal, not a human voice. What is it? he asked. Kirk burst through the door and headed for the street entrance. Everyone else in the office was going the same way. Meta looked confused, leaning towards the door, then looking back at Jason. What does it mean? Can't you tell me? He shook her arm. Sector alarm. A major breakthrough of some kind at the perimeter. Everyone but other perimeter guards has to answer. Well, go then, he said. Don't worry by me. I'll be all right. His words acted like a trigger release. Meta's gun was in her hand, and she was gone before he had finished speaking. Jason sat down wearily in the deserted office. The unnatural silence in the building began to get on his nerves. He shifted his chair over to the phone screen and switched it on to receive. The screen exploded with color and sound. At first Jason could make no sense of it at all, just a confused jumble of faces and voices. It was a multi-channel set designed for military use. A number of images were carried on the screen at one time, rows of heads or hazy backgrounds where the user had left the field of view. Many of the heads were talking at the same time, and the babble of their voices made no sense whatsoever. After examining the controls and making a few experiments, Jason began to understand the operation. Though all stations were on the screen at all times, their audio channels could be controlled. In that way, two, three, or more stations could be hooked together in a link-up. They would be in round-robin communication with each other, yet never out of contact with the other stations. Identification between voice and sound was automatic. Whenever one of the pictured images spoke, the image would glow red. By trial and error, Jason brought in the audio for the stations he wanted and tried to follow the course of the attack. Very quickly he realized this was something out of the ordinary. In some way no one made it clear. A section of the perimeter had been broken through, and emergency defenses had to be thrown up to encapsulate it. Kirk seemed to be in charge, at least he was the only one with an override transmitter. He used it for general commands. The many tiny images faded, and his face appeared on top of them, filling the entire screen. All perimeter stations send twenty-five percent of your complement to Area Twelve. The small images reappeared, and the babble increased, red lights flickering from face to face. Abandon the first floor. Acid bombs can't reach. If we hold, we'll be cut off, but salient has passed us on the west flank. Request support. Don't merve, it's useless. And the napalm tanks are almost gone. Orders? The truck is still there. Get it to the supply warehouse. You'll find replacements. Out of the welter of talk, only the last two fragments made any sense. Jason had noticed the signs below when he came in. 
the first two floors of the building below him were jammed with military supplies this was his chance to get into the act just sitting and watching was frustrating particularly when it was a desperate emergency he didn't overvalue his worth but he was sure there was always room for another gun by the time he had dragged himself down to the street level a turbo truck had slammed to a stop in front of the loading platform two perrins were rolling out drums of napalm with reckless disregard for their own safety jason didn't dare enter that maelstrom of rolling metal he found he could be of use tucking the heavy drums into position on the truck while the others rolled them up they accepted his aid without acknowledgment it was exhausting sweaty work hauling the leaden drums into place against the heavy gravity after a minute jason worked by touch through a red haze of hammering blood he realized the job was done only when the truck suddenly leaped forward and he was thrown to the floor he lay there his chest heaving as the driver hurled the heavy vehicle along all jason could do was bounce along in the bottom he could see well enough but he was still gasping for breath when they braked at the fighting zone to jason it was a scene of incredible confusion guns firing flames men and women running on all sides the napalm drums were unloaded without his help and the truck vanished for more Jason leaned against a wall of a half-destroyed building and tried to get his bearings. It was impossible. There seemed to be a great number of small animals. He killed two that attacked him. Other than that, he couldn't determine the nature of the battle. A Piran, tan face white with pain and exertion, stumbled up. His right arm, wet with raw flesh and dripping blood, hung limply at his side. It was covered with freshly applied surgical foam. He held his gun in his left hand, a stump of control cable dangling from it. Jason thought the man was looking for medical aid. He couldn't have been more wrong. Clenching the gun in his teeth, the Piran clutched a battle of napalm with his good hand and hurled it over its side. Then, with the gun once more in his hand, he began to roll the drum along the ground with his feet. It was slow, cumbersome work, but he was still in the fight. Jason pushed through the hurrying crowd and bent over the drum. Let me do it, he said. You can cover us both with your gun. The man wiped the sweat from his eyes with the back of his arm and blinked at Jason. He seemed to recognize him. When he smiled, it was with a grimace of pain, empty of humor. Do that. I can still shoot. Two half-men, maybe we equal one whole. Jason was laboring too hard to even notice the insult. An explosion had blasted a raw pit in the street ahead. Two people were at the bottom, digging it even deeper with shovels. The whole thing seemed meaningless. Just as Jason and the wounded man rolled up the drum, the diggers leaped out of the excavation and began shooting down into its depths. One of them turned, a young girl, barely in her teens. "'Praise perimeter,' she breathed. "'They found the napalm. One of the new horrors is breaking through towards thirteen. We just found it.' Even as she talked, she swiveled the drum around, kicked the easy-off plug, and began dumping the jellied contents into the hole. When half of it had gurgled down, she kicked the drum itself in. Her companion pulled a flare from his belt, lit it, and threw it after the drum back quick they don't like heat he said this was putting it very mildly the napalm caught tongues of flame and roiling greasy smoke climbed up to the sky under jason's feet the earth shifted and moved something black and long stirred in the heart of the flame then arched up into the sky over their heads in the midst of the searing heat it still moved with alien, jolting motions. It was immense, at least two meters thick, and with no indication of its length. The flames didn't stop it at all, just annoyed it. Jason had some idea of the thing's length, as the street cracked and buckled for fifty meters on each side of the pit. Great loops of the creature began to emerge from the ground. 
He fired his gun, as did the others. Not that it seemed to have any effect. More and more people were appearing, armed with a variety of weapons. Flamethrowers and grenades seemed to be the most effective. Clear the area. We're going to saturate it. Fall back. The voice was so loud it jarred Jason's ear. He turned and recognized Kirk, who had arrived with truckloads of equipment. He had a power speaker on his back. The mic hung in front of his lips. His amplified voice brought an instant reaction from the crowd. They began to move. There was still doubt in Jason's mind what to do. Clear the area? But what area? He started towards Kirk before he realized that the rest of the Pyrrhans were going in the opposite direction. Even under two gravities they moved. Jason had a naked feeling of being alone on the stage. He was in the center of the street and the others had vanished. No one remained except the wounded man Jason had helped. He stumbled towards Jason, waving his good arm. Jason couldn't understand what he said. Kirk was shouting orders again from one of the trucks. They had started to move, too. The urgency struck home, and Jason started to run. It was too late. On all sides the earth was buckling, cracking, as more loops of the underground thing forced its way into the light. Safety lay ahead. Only in front of it rose an arch of dirt-encrusted gray. There are seconds of time that seem to last an eternity, a moment of subjective time that is grabbed and stretched to an infinite distance. This was one of those moments. Jason stood frozen. Even the smoke in the sky hung unmoving. The high-standing loop of alien life was before him, every detail piercingly clear. Thick as a man, ribbed and gray as old bark, tendrils projected from all parts of it, pallid and twisting lengths that writhed slowly with snake-like life, shaped like a plant, yet with the motions of an animal and cracking, splitting, this was the worst. Seams and openings appeared, splintering, gaping mouths that vomited out a horde of pallid animals. Jason heard their shriekings, shrill yet remote. He saw the needle-like teeth that lined their jaws. The paralysis of the unknown held him there. He should have died. Kirk was thundering at him through the power speakers. Other were firing into the attacking creature. Jason knew nothing. Then he was shot forward, pushed by a rock-hard shoulder. The wounded man was still there, trying to get Jason clear. Gun clenched in his jaws, he dragged Jason along with his good arm. Towards the creature. The others stopped firing. They saw his plan, and it was a good one. A loop of the thing arched into the air, leaving an opening between its body and the ground. The wounded Pyrrhon planted his feet and tightened his muscles. One-handed, with a single thrust, he picked Jason off the ground and sent him hurtling under the living arch. Moving tendrils brushed fire along his face. Then he was through, rolling over and over on the ground. The wounded Pyrrhon leaped after him. It was too late. There had been a chance for one person to get out. The Pyrrhon could have done it easily. Instead, he had pushed Jason first. The thing was aware of movement when Jason brushed its tendrils. It dropped and caught the wounded man under its weight. He vanished from sight as the tendrils wrapped around him and the animals swarmed over. His trigger must have pulled back to full automatic, because the gun kept firing a long time after he should have been dead. Jason crawled. Some of the fanged animals ran towards him but were shot. He knew nothing about this. Then rude hands grabbed him up and pulled him forward. He slammed into the side of a truck, and Kirk's face was in front of his, flushed and angry. One of the giant fists closed on the front of Jason's clothes 
and he was lifted off his feet, shaken like a limp bag of rags. He offered no protest, and could not, even if Kirk had killed him. When he was thrown to the ground, someone picked him up and slid him into the back of the truck. He did not lose consciousness as the truck bounced away, yet he could not move. In a moment the fatigue would go away and he would sit up. That was all he was, just a little tired. Even as he thought this, he passed out. End of Part 12